The message today is about the midnight hour. Do you know the midnight hour? We've been talking about worship. We've been talking about the core values of our house. And we talked last week about how worship is a lifestyle. It's everything we do. It's not an hour, but it's in every hour. And as we were talking about that last week and then the core class that we've been doing the last few weeks together on the theology of worship, we've been talking about worship as a weapon. And I wanna talk more about that today because all of us are coming to the midnight hour. In fact, some of you are in the midnight hour right now. I'm not talking about time on a clock when it's 12 uh, a.m. I'm talking about that season of life where it's just dark all around you. I was thinking about a few friends of ours who are in the midnight hour. In fact, in the core class that I just led on the theology of worship, the very first Wednesday, a few weeks ago, coming into the class, sat a couple in our church. The last Wednesday night that they had been in our church building, they came to a core class 33 weeks ago or so. They were waiting for the class to start, got a message on their phone, a phone call came, they left the gathering room, went out into the oval at 515, sat, waited for more information. The news that they had received was that there had been an accident and their daughter, who's 29 years old and living in the Midwest, was unaccounted for. And a few calls later, they got the news on a Wednesday night, sitting in the oval of our building, that their 29-year-old daughter had gone to heaven. So Wednesdays are hard for them. Wednesday evenings are hard for them. But on this particular Wednesday, they said, you know what? It's time for us to go back to core. It's time for us to be back in the house. We're choosing the core class that's on worship and we are going and we are showing up. And I remember walking in the first night and looking down and seeing them sitting right there in that core class in the midnight hour of their life, showing up, believing that there's something about worship that works in the midnight hour to change our lives. I was thinking of my, my friend who I spent time this, with this week who a little less than two years ago, his 18-year-old son was killed in a violent act and he's in the midnight hour. Thinking about families in our church that are struggling people sitting in this gathering right now that feel like the pressure is so great, it's just going to annihilate them. People whose dreams are going up in smoke, relationships that are blowing apart, people who had something they were counting on and either the person they were counting on or the outcome they were counting on just completely diverted course. People are facing internal pressure that even the closest people around you don't know how close you are to cracking altogether, and it just feels like the midnight hour. People who have been in a diagnosis, and you've been up, and you've been down, and you've been up, and you've been down, and it's looked positive, then it looked bleak, and then it looked more positive, then it looked bleak, and you just don't know if you can go one more step in the midnight hour. And I want you to know today that there is a way to navigate the midnight hour and it has, interestingly enough, a lot to do with the song of praise. It seems counter to the way that a human mind would think, but worship isn't just what we do at high noon. Worship is powerful when it is the operational function of our lives in the darkest hours of our lives. And I'll tell you the, the most encouraging thing, if you're in the midnight hour today, and if you are, I know you're thinking, okay, I'm so glad I'm hearing this message, but I already know everyone in this gathering right now is thinking about somebody you know that's in the midnight hour. And you're going to text them if they're not already in this gathering and say, you've got to listen to this message. But in the midnight hour, the thing that you need to know the most today is that God is in the midnight hour. In fact, our story today, the reason we're at church today is because the whole earth was in a midnight hour. God didn't come into a happy celebration to say, wow, I know life's perfect and everything's going just right and Jesus, he'll be the cherry on top. No, God came into a world that was falling apart. And in a world that was broken down and falling apart, that was on a dead end street with no hope, 
God spoke. This is the reason we're at church today is because God comes into the midnight hour. The prophet Isaiah even prophesied about Jesus. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, Isaiah 61. These words are the words Jesus chose to make his entry speech into his ministry on planet earth. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise. There it is already in the text. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planning of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Who will? The poor will, the brokenhearted will, the captive will, the prisoner will, the mourner will, the grieving will, the pile of ashes will, those in despair will. Those are the ones that are going to be a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And then he says in the next line, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. So when Jesus took on these words and spoke them out to announce what he had come to do. What he was saying was, I've come into the midnight hour to bring hope in the darkest place of all. He didn't say, hey, looks like everything's going great for you and all your plans are coming to fruition. So I've just come to amen that and add a special blessing on top. He didn't come to say, hey, I I know that uh, you just got raised up in the best way possible and you're experiencing all the greatest things in life and I just thought I'd come alongside, put my arm around you and just be an extra special, you know, treat for you while you're on earth. No, he said, I came into a broken mess. I came into a dead end street. I came into a no way out and I arrived in that place saying, I'm gonna change everything. I've got the power to change. Change this story, even starting in the darkest hour. And you and I need that. You need to know today that God is in your midnight hour. And if you don't know that, then the midnight hour has the power and the possibility to extinguish your faith altogether. You know, when we're in that dark place, a couple of things happen. I've showed this at our church many, many times, but I can't see it enough. When we're in that challenge, oftentimes all we can see is the problem. All we see is the death, the brokenness, the pain, the hurt, the injustice, the thing that went wrong, the crash, the burn, the ashes. All we see is the problem. And if we're not careful, the problem will become so prevalent in our thinking and our vision that it will block out our view of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Almighty Holy God. And you've seen this happen and it's probably at some point happened to you where the problem was so prevalent that it blocked out your ability to see the goodness of God. And you, you, you didn't worship. Of course you didn't worship. What do you mean worship? I don't even know if God's here. I don't even know if God knows about me. I don't even know if God sees me. I don't even know honestly if God exists. And you can track back a lot of people's story. You can go back seven years, eight years, 14 years, and they will tell you, I haven't been in church in X amount of time. And then they'll let you know why. The moment they walked out the door and didn't come back was the moment where something tragic and painful happened in their life. And it so extinguished in them their concept of who God was. They said, I don't want anything to do with this God. And I am out. That's why it's so essential that we are in the house of God today because the the midnight hour's coming 
It already has come for those of us in this room. Amen. Some of us are in the middle of it right now. And the midnight hour is coming again for all of us in this room. And in that moment, that darkness has the power to extinguish our concept of God. If our concept of God was simply, I go to church occasionally. I, I, I believe in God. I have a couple of different versions of the Bible at home. My grandmother was a believer, and, and I'm real confident in knowing that, you know, there's a God. And I came and we sang the songs, and we did the deal, and I went to the men's thing, and I went to the women's thing. But it never really was a foundational, growing, active relationship with God. And when the darkness came, I didn't have enough strength and enough maturity in my heart to stand up in the darkest hour of all. And that darkness just absolutely obliterated my view of God. But see, we have a choice, and that's what we're talking about today. It's not denying this, and this is not the message today. It's not belittling it. It's not winking at it. It's understanding that it's real, and it's painful, and it's dark, and it's hard. But it's choosing to change our perspective, and that's what worship does. And it's saying, I'm not going to say there isn't a problem. I'm just going to put God in view. And I'm going to view the problem through what I know of the character of God versus viewing God through what I know of the nature of the problem. I'm going to choose to view the problem through the frame of the faithfulness of my God, a God who came to this earth and died in the midnight hour so that I could be alive and set free from a broken world of bondage and poverty and mourning and grieving and have hope and a relationship with God that I could be recentered in a sovereign story of a mighty God. So I'm choosing now a new perspective uh, and I'm choosing to see God first and then to see everything else through the lens of who I know God to be. And when that happens, things begin to change in our lives. Worship becomes a weapon in the midnight hour. I'm going to just pause and see if anybody wants to applaud for that. I know somebody is wanting to say amen because this is real. And I've told my story dozens of times. I won't tell it again today, but I'm not preaching from the choir. I'm standing here today, literally standing here today because a song of praise led me out of the midnight hour. And it is not simplification. It's just choosing to step into a new perspective. It's going to require a few things. Number one, that we see that to change the midnight hour, we need a posture of surrender. This is what we learned about in the theology of worship class. And Brett touched on this story and a couple others that I want to mention, but in 2 Chronicles 20, back to this story that we talk about a lot in our story of faith. It's the story of Jehoshaphat and the people of God. They were facing three armies. They were facing the, the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Menunites. So, you know, when you say the phrase, if it's not one thing, it's another. Well, in, in their case, it was one thing and another, and another. And the word came to Jehoshaphat, there are three armies, they've decided to tag team on us and they're all approaching right now. So if you're Jehoshaphat, what are you gonna do? If that's your situation right now and you get the phone call from the doctor and um, someone bails out on the relationship and uh, the economy blows up and it all happens on the same day or your kid makes a really bad decision or all of a sudden there's financial pressure that you didn't see coming and uh, there is a phone call that you weren't expecting and it's all happening right at the same time in the same way. You're in the position that Jehoshaphat was in and it says in 2 Chronicles 20 verse three, he was alarmed and that's a good thing to be. So if you get alarmed in the midnight hour, don't feel like you're failing God. But then he inquired of the Lord and declared a fast over Judah. And then eventually he stood up to speak to the people. We're jumping in toward the end of this down in verse 12. He says, 
We do not know what to do. He's praying now. But our eyes are upon you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, And he said, verse 15, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They'll be climbing up by the pass at Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Man, that you want to be uh, the prophet who gets that word in that moment. That's a drop the mic word right there. That is a thus saith the Lord. I'm coming in to a moment where there is just darkness closing in on every side and I'm gonna bring this word of hope. But look at the response because the response is where you and I come in. In verse 18, Jehoshaphat, hearing this word of God's deliverance and power, bowed with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. So the posture in the midnight hour, the first posture upon hearing about God's delivering power is to bow down and in Jehoshaphat's case, to put your face on the ground. Now, for me, that begs the question, when is the last time any of our faces were on the ground? Because that posture says, I don't have any options here. But instead of fixing my eyes on the adversary, the circumstance, the situation, the difficulty, the pain, the brokenness, the death, the loss, I'm going to put my face down where I can't see anything in the natural. I can only see God in my heart. And I can believe again that there is a God in heaven that is bigger than everything that I'm in the middle of. And that's what God is calling for you. It's normally the the last thing we do, and it needs to be the first thing we do. We want to get in a posture where we flex, but God's not, not asking you to flex today. If you're in the midnight hour, he's just saying surrender right where you are. Just surrender and say what Jehoshaphat said. I don't know what to do, God, but my eyes are on you. I don't have a solution, but my eyes are on you. I'm not going to A, B, C, go to the, the quick fix or the retaliation or what I can do or how I can bow up. I'm going to start with putting my face on the ground before the throne of Almighty God, and I'm going to say, God, my hope is in you. But then I want you to see what happened next. Then some Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites, they stood up and they praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud voice. So hope came Surrender came, and then worship happened. Can I remind us that there are three armies coming? We don't have time to surrender. (laughs) We don't have time to get down on our face. And we definitely don't have time to stand up and praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud voice. There are three armies on the way. But Jehoshaphat somehow knew worship is a weapon, and worship saves your life in the midnight hour. And so look what happened. Early in the morning, they left out for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah, and people of Jerusalem. He now had heard the word. He's repeating the word. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat anointed men to sing to the Lord. Now, this is how you know this is a supernatural story. Men are singing to the Lord. And to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And they went out at the head of the army saying, 
Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. We'll come back to this at the very end, but they went out to battle. They, they did not sit back and go, oh, we're just going to praise God over here. No, they, they, they suited up and they went out. But at the front of them, these men were singing. Not the most complex song of all time. They, they weren't singing, we're coming in the power of God. We're going to gouge your eyes out. No, they were just singing this very simple song. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Hear that. Hear our roar. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. And you know this story. They come over the hill and these enemies have gotten confused. They've all killed each other. The battle is over. Worship went out and was a weapon for the people. It started in a posture of surrender. It ended in the power of a song. The third thing you need to know about the midnight hour is that worship invites God in to the midnight hour. The psalmist said in Psalm 22, verse 3, it's almost literally translated, the Lord is enthroned on the praises of Israel. But it can be interpreted, God inhabits the praises of his people. In other words, worship is like a magnet. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. But when he hears worship, especially when it's the heart of faith in the middle of the dark hour, he, he comes into that atmosphere. If you want God to really come in and, and, and dwell you in the midnight hour, then build him a throne of praise and he will come and sit on that throne of praise. He is enthroned on the praises of Israel and he's enthroned on your praises. And if you really want God moving into your situation, then build him a throne and he will come and sit on that throne. He moves towards the sacrifice of praise. He invades the confession of worship. When he hears complaining, it causes God to move away. And when he hears confident worship, even when you can't see why, but you know he is good because of what he's already done for you, that is a magnet that draws God in to the situation. And we see this all through scripture, but no more so than in the text that we've shared a lot at Passion City. But I'm telling you, I could preach this text every single week because somebody every single week is in the midnight hour. Paul and Silas, Acts 16 in verse 25, are in jail, beat up, smashed up, in the bottom of the prison, in stocks, hands and feet. And it says about them, in literally in darkness, pitch black darkness, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They chose in the prison to not let the prison define God. They chose to let God define the prison. All they had done was exercise their gift and authority. They set a girl free. Unfortunately, it put her slave owner out of business. He went and complained to the city leaders they came and arrested them and smashed them up and put them in jail. So they had every right to do probably what everybody who'd been in those stocks had done, to murmur, to grumble, to speak evil, to retaliate. But these guys at midnight, all beat up, are singing a hymn of praise to God. This is the moment where I just like to know what they were singing. Because I don't think it was super loud and defiant, but I don't know, could have been. A mighty fortress is our God. I don't know. They, they, they got swollen lips. They got eyes that are shut and lacerations on their face and whelps on their back, cuts on their side, hands in stocks. Could have just been, raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. We raise a hallelujah and heaven 
comes to fight for me Cause I'm gonna sing In the middle of a storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Could have just been that but when they sang, they built a throne and God came and sat on that throne. He came. He's like, how, how do you know? How, how, how do you know he, he, he came and sat on that throne? Because we, we see in the text that their worship activated kingdom plans, set in motion dominoes in the heavens. Because... Suddenly, the text says, there was a violent earthquake, and it shook the prison, and all the prison doors swung open. That weapon of praise was power, and it was defiant. You know, Habakkuk 2 is defiant worship. Lord, we, we've heard of your fame. We've heard of your deeds. We need you to do them again in our day. Habakkuk was in a, in a moment in time where the whole of Israel was in a bind. But his defiance came at the end. I believe, God, that you can move. I believe, God, that you're great. I believe, God, that you can come into the dark hour. But here's the thing. Even if you don't, we're going to worship you. Even if there's no grapes on the vine, no crops in the field, if there's no herd no sheep, no oil, yet will I praise you. And I will put my trust in the Lord. It's a defiance that says, you know what? I've seen enough of God on the cross and I believe enough in the goodness of God that even in this dark hour where nothing makes sense, I wanna go on record. If there's a record, put me on the record. Even though it is dark, God is still good. And even though the powers of hell have come against me, I will praise my God. Write it down somewhere in the spiritual world. I am defying all the darkness. And I'm telling you, there's an eternity coming where you're not going to have the opportunity to do that. But in, in this planet, in this world, that's where you have your chances. To say, put me on record. My God is good. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My God is good. Everything around me is bad. But I will praise him and I will put my hope in him. Nothing is fair. but I'm gonna praise God. And do you know what happens? It garners the attention of those around and it changes you. It says in this text, about midnight they were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners, your translation might say, and all the prisoners were listening to them. Even that quiet little song. Because see, this wasn't some six-story, multi-building compound. <laughs> this was a Philippian jail that may, may have had a couple dozen people in it. Everybody was in earshot. And all of them were hearing something they'd never heard before. And all of them were thinking, who are they singing to? Who are they singing about? Who are these men? And soon they found out. All of us worship in the noonday, 
But when we choose to believe in God in the midnight hour, I'm telling you, the people in your office, they're listening. People in your world, your sphere, they're listening and you can't stop it. You couldn't stop this prison revival this night. Nobody could stop this prison revival this night. Why? Because you had two guys who were sold out to a confident belief that a sovereign God was in charge of their lives, that a good God was in charge of their lives. Maybe they remembered in that night because they were Old Testament Bible scholars. Maybe they remembered in that night, Paul did. I remember Jehoshaphat. Let's sing it, let's sing it. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Let's just keep believing that tonight. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. It shut down the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Minyanites, and it's going to shut down whatever's coming against us tonight. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. And they were in a line of the faithfulness of God. They were in a story of the sovereignty of God. They were reminding themselves. And their circumstance, honestly, really didn't change that much. You're like, oh, yes, it did. The, the doors flew open. The jailer woke up in the earthquake, he comes running in with his sword thinking he's gonna take his life because everybody escaped and it's gonna be on him. They, they, they call for the light and Paul has already announced, hey, chill out, man, we're all here. They, they bring the torches in and sure enough, they're all there and the jailer's like, what's going on? And they tell him about Jesus and they tell him he needs to be forgiven and he needs to repent of his sin and he says I want to get saved and he gets saved that night and he gets so saved that he goes and gets his family and they all get saved and they all get baptized that night and they have a change of heart instantly so that the jailer starts tending to the wounds of Paul and Silas. Their wounds did not go away apparently or else he would not have to attend to them. So they still had an eye that was shut and a laceration on their lip and they still had whelps on their back and a big gash in their side. They still had all of the heart and the pain and all of the implications of what had happened to them. But yet their praise had changed them and changed them. Ultimately, their circumstance did change and God's not opposed to that. These men were falsely accused and Paul told them, I'm a Roman citizen and I didn't get due process and somebody's gonna be real nervous when they hear that. He, 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 he did not just stop and say, okay, we got, we got out and that was all good. People got saved, it was a great night. He said, oh, and by the way, I, I want some justice in this situation. But even in that, and even though they got let go, they still were all smashed up. So it's no guarantee that the song in the night instantly changes the whole circumstance, but it is a guarantee that the song in the night will have an impact on you and it will change you in the circumstance. And it'll save your life. A song in the night will save your life. So if you're in the midnight hour, what do you do? You start by getting on your face and surrendering before God. Louis, I just lost my son. I would say, get on your face. Louis, we just got a call. I'm saying, get on your face. Louis, it's all blowing up and going crazy around me. Have you, have you got on your face? Are you on your face? Start by surrendering to a great God. Secondly, get a Jehaziel in your life. Get a voice in your life that will say, listen to me, God is good. Listen to me. God's got a plan. Listen to me, God is gonna come through for you. Listen to me, God is fighting for you. Listen to me, do not listen to them. Listen to me, God is the God of the ages and you belong to him. Listen to me, there's nothing that's too big for God. Listen to me, God is with you in the midnight hour. Get a Jehaziel and get them close to you and get everybody else in your life four layers away. 
all the people who are telling you, you deserve better than this. Let's see what we can do to get even. Let's try to find out a solution or commiserating with you or just you know having another drink with you or saying they're gonna pray for you and I'm really sorry to hear that. Get all of them away and get a Jehaziel in your life who says, thus say it the Lord, the God of Israel is with you. Thus say it the Lord, the God of Israel is on your side. Thus say it the Lord, God Almighty is gonna fight this battle for you. You are gonna see the salvation of God in your life. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know what, but I do know God. And I'm telling you, when the darkness closes in, tries to extinguish your faith, it's, it's most likely that the voices around you are people that have had the darkness extinguish their faith. And they've got nothing to offer you. But ask God, for a voice of God who will bring the word of God to your story. Thirdly, lock eyes with Jesus. It's so easy when we're in that, in that place to just be totally fixated by the darkness. But Jehoshaphat said, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Discipline of vision, looking for the hope that only comes from you. And then lastly, lead with a song. It doesn't have to be complex. Most likely it's not gonna be a track listing of 15 songs. When you're in the kind of darkness I'm talking about, you normally don't have that kind of capacity. You need a phrase, a verse, a chorus that is biblical and that mirrors hope that you can hold on to. And you need it in the day and you need it in the night. You need it every moment, you need it every hour. You need it when you're rising, you need it when you're going to sleep, you need it in your car, you need it when you're walking, you need it at your work, you need it when you're eating. You, you need that song and you need to lead with that song. That is your way to step in to the power of this moment to say, you know what, I have a song. I'm not even a good singer, but you know what, God doesn't care. It says, and the men said, give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. They, they, didn't, they weren't singing in four-part harmony. They, they didn't break out in a gospel choir. They, they, they weren't on the worship team. They just had faith of heart. Faith moves the heart of God. He doesn't need more songs. He wants belief and faith and hope. He doesn't need more songs. He wants to render people who believe. He's sitting on a throne. And if you will bring that song, lead with that song, here's what I promise you. God will show you what to do next. Because I don't know what you need to do next but he'll show you. He told them exactly what was going down. Go to, they're coming this way and this way. You go here, you go here. I want the army to come. I want you to show up tomorrow. Show up tomorrow. I think that's the main thing he's gonna say to you. Show up tomorrow. That's what he's gonna tell you. Sing a song and show up tomorrow. Get on your knees and then show up tomorrow. Put your face on the ground, then show up tomorrow. Get a confession of worship, then show up tomorrow. Praise me, then show up tomorrow. Invite me in, then show up tomorrow. Build a throne, then show up tomorrow. Call on heaven, then show up tomorrow and see what God will do. In their case, he wiped out all the enemies. And you might do that in your case. Or maybe he'll say, go right, go left. Maybe he'll say, tell him you're a Roman citizen and demand justice. Maybe he'll say, I want you to forgive. Maybe he'll say, I want you to go left. Who knows what he'll say, but he will lead you tomorrow. If you show up with a song of praise, he will lead you. He will lead you. He is with you. And if you feel shredded right now, he feels all that with you. If your life is just splattered on the ground, he feels that. He loves you. And he's just wanting to remind you today, I am the great I am. And I came for you in the midnight hour. And when I said it is finished, the sky was black and a violent earthquake shook the ground and all the tombs around me were open and dead people flew out alive 
just by me being in the midnight hour for you. I love you. Keep your eyes on me. Don't lose hope. Worship God and invite light into the dark. It will be.